22. And now behold, I go bound in the spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesses in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. One of the things here that uh, I want you to draw your attention to and, and it is what, what Paul said, but none of these things move me. In other words, you know, there was a lot of stuff he said, in every place, in every town, in every city, the Holy Ghost was bearing witness to him that he was going to abide in chains and, bound, and be bound. He was going to be imprisoned. He was going to be taken uh, and, and set apart. He was going to face things that he didn't necessarily want to face. But Paul said, none of those things moved me. None of those things stirred me. In other words, none of those things got him worried, got him fretted got him in trouble, you know. And I believe the children of God, I believe us as the church, we've got to be like Paul was in seeing that whatever's coming up on this world, whatever's coming up on the community, whatever's coming up on our lives as individuals, none of these things need to move us because the spirit and the presence and the power of God and the anointing of God is abiding in us. To Paul, that's all that mattered was Jesus was living in his heart. He had the presence and the power and the unction of the Spirit abiding and resting upon him and in him. And he knew that whatever he had to face, that the Lord was with him. And I believe if we get a hold of what Paul was saying, that none of these things move me, none of these things stir me, none of these things make me afraid, because I know who I've trusted. I, I know who's walked with me. I, I know who it is uh, who I met on on the way to Damascus, uh, I know that bright light. I know that voice that spoke to me and told me to go and preach unto the nations. Uh, and I'm going to keep on preaching yeah. until he takes me out of here. Whether he was saying, you know, whether I go by the grave or by the rapture, you know, I believe they were looking for the rapture in their day. Yeah. I believe the church was looking for the coming of the Lord. And now I look here we are some 2,000 odd years later. We're closer to the coming of the Lord than we've ever been. And if the church has stopped looking for the rapture, then something's wrong. We've got to be expecting. We've got to be looking. We've got to be anticipating because it changes our actions and everything that we do down here. If we think that we're just going to live to a grand old life and, and, and be a, 103 years old and, and, and then we're going to lay it all down and, and, and it's going to carry on to our kids and our grandkids and all that sort of thing, and we think we've got all the time in the world, where is our urgency? But I believe as the church we should be expecting that just any moment, just any second, just any day, our urgency gets to the point where we start telling people, hey, Jesus is coming. Now, do you know Christ as your Savior? Are you born again? Are you ready to meet him? In, the, in, this, in Pentecost, if you study Pentecost, Christians, we celebrate the coming and the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. Uh, the Jews called this the Feast of Harvest or the Feast of Weeks to celebrate the first Wheat harvest being 50 days or seven weeks from Passover. It was also known as the Feast of the First Fruits, which was the beginning of the barley harvest. This, this was Paul's uh, near the end of Paul's third missionary journey, where he declared to those in Miletus of the departure and that they would see him no more. If you go on and read verse 25, he said, You're not going to see my face anymore, but I'm, I'm going on. None of these things move me. I won't come back. I won't be able to come back to see you. You know, but he said, I'm going home for Jesus. What, what a testimony in Paul's life. I, I think so many times how much, uh, you know, we think of uh, Paul and, we, you know, we think about how that he, it just, nothing deterred him. You know, I, I'm sure he was human. I'm sure he faced uh, things that, you know, great enormity and weight and bearing upon him. I'm sure he faced things and his thought process probably happened a lot to, to be like mine and yours. But yet, 
None of those things moved him. He didn't allow those things that troubled his spirit and his soul to move him. He trusted in the Lord Jesus for everything. And that's what you and I can do. He was led of the Spirit. He knew something about being led of the Spirit. And I, more than anything, I want me, I want myself to be led of the Spirit. I want this church to be led of the Spirit. You know, I, there's there's things, I'll be, I'll be honest with you, I've seen a lot of things lately. And, and, and sometimes I'll listen to them a little bit, and, and I'm still just kind of, mm, I don't know about this stuff. Uh, but I see a lot of preachers and a lot of people out there prophesying, oh, what God is going to do, and the glory of God, and, and the return of America, and all this stuff. And I'm thinking, whoa, hold on here, that just don't add up. It don't add up to me, and it worries me, it troubles me that you see a lot of people prophesying good things. And, you know, you can go back to the scriptures and find out that they prophesied uh, uh, the things that they thought were good things for Israel and that they were going to prosper and they were going to do this and that and the other, and they were going to go forward in God. But God said, no, I didn't send them. He said, I didn't send them, nor did I give them their message that they're proclaiming. And, and he was actually had the opposite message for the children of Israel. Than what some false prophets and preachers are. And so there's a lot of people, there's a lot of rumblings out there that I hear of things that, and I'm thinking, hmm, God, what in the world is going on? Now, I believe all things work for good to them that love the Lord. That don't mean that we don't go through troubles and trials and tests down here on this earth. It doesn't mean, I mean, you look at the first church, you look, they were persecuted. They, were, they went through troubles. They went through trials. They went through tests. Uh, they went through, even through death uh, to get the gospel of the kingdom out. I'm not saying that that's all that's going to happen here. But I'm not going to say it's going to be all rosy and great and, and glorious down here either. It's not till Jesus comes back is it going to be glorious and grand. Amen. And the Spirit's not going to lead you anywhere out of the Scripture. If it goes in the Word of God, if you can correlate it with the Word of God, then it's true. If you can correlate it in God's Word, if, if, if God's Word is saying it, if God's Word is speaking it, then it's true. But if anything we say that we make up, that we think God's doing, then you might as well forget it. Amen. Sometimes, you know, we've got things in our mind and a set way of doing things, and we've got something in our mind that we, we think it's this way, but God's wanting to move in a different direction. And sometimes, you know, it takes a while to get me to step out in faith, or it takes me a while to step out to where I'm obedient unto God because I want to make sure it's Him. And the devil tries to defeat us time and time again about that stuff. I know he does me tries to keep me from doing what God is telling me to do, all because my mind. Sometimes we question God, is that really you? When God's just wanting us to be obedient and move in the power and the presence and the spirit of the Lord. We can be led by the spirit as the story goes on. Right, let me go back up just a little bit. They had sailed. They went to chaos. The next day it said they arrived at Samos and they tarried at Trogillum. And then it said the next day they went to Miletus. And Paul determined to sail by Ephesus because he would not spend the time in Asia for he hastened. If it were possible for him to be at Jerusalem the day of Pentecost. Now whether Paul desired to celebrate Pentecost there is not for certain. But we do know that he was led by the Spirit. The Spirit of the Lord was leading him. It may be that somebody is, is all, the last time you're going to see them, they may be needing to know about Jesus, and God can send you right their way just to tell them about Jesus. Paul here, he, went, he was able to, you, you talk about knowing what the Spirit did. I, I believe he knew the Spirit because one thing he said, none of these things moved me. None of these things move me. He says, he wrote, God, the Spirit gave him verses such as this, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, Romans 8 and 6. 1 Corinthians 2, 9 and 10, he said, But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. 
But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. The Spirit can direct us into the deep things of God. If we want to see God move in 2022, we just need to allow the Spirit to move and operate in our life. And not just on Sunday, not just on Wednesday, but every day. Let the Spirit move in your life. Some of the commentaries say that Paul was bound by the Spirit to go to Jerusalem. In other words, he was compelled to go to that city. And then there's other scholars that believe that the Spirit was letting him know about the facing imprisonment. I believe the Spirit of the Lord was doing both, both directing him and also letting him know what was coming. You know, the Spirit will do that. He'll let us know exactly what's ahead of us. If we listen, if we'll watch, if we'll pray, if we keep seeking his face, I want to be closer to the Lord in 2022 than I ever have been. And I pray that's your desire. I believe that should be every Christian's desire. That we walk in the spirit and the presence and the power and the anointing of God like we've never done before. You know, I, I believe God can do some things that we have never seen before. People that's put off getting saved. It's time they stop putting it off. It's time they stop looking for other things to fill the void. It's time they start coming to the house of the Lord. It's time they start praying and reading their Bibles. This is the year. This has to be the year. I don't know when Jesus is coming back, as I said this morning, but I believe that we're getting closer, and it's more than we could ever imagine. It's that we have this treasure in earth and the vessels that the power, excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. He says we are troubled on every side. It sounds like he knew what we know today, don't it? Troubled on every side, not, but yet not distressed. He says we are perplexed. Are you perplexed about some things in this world today? I know I sure am. <laughs> I scratch my head more, more often than not nowadays. I just don't get it. Some of it I don't want to get. Amen. But I've never seen a day that we're living in just quite like the day. We're perplexed, but we're not in despair. We got Jesus. We've got Jesus. We've got him in our lives. We're persecuted, but we're not forsaken. Jesus hadn't forgotten about us. He hadn't left us all alone. We have the comforter inside. We have the comforter walking with us through everything that we've got to go through. He says we're cast down. But we're not destroyed. The devil can do anything he wants to to come at us. He may even get, get the place where we, we lose our life one of these days for the gospel of the kingdom. But you know, there's one thing he can't destroy. He can't destroy your soul. He can't take that soul that God has created. He can't take that salvation that was given so freely by Jesus at the cross of Calvary. He, he can't take it away. He would like to take it away. He would like to do, be able to destroy you, to completely annihilate you, but he can't do it by the power, by the blood of Jesus. You are set free. You are set apart. You are made for praise. You are made to rejoice in him, and the devil can't do anything about it. We'll always give him praise. We'll always give him glory. Jesus deserves our glory, his, this glory and praise more than anything else. But what moves us? Are we moved? I'm concerned about not just this church, but I'm concerned about the church world as a whole. I'm wondering what moves us sometimes. What moves us? And if anything COVID should have taught us is this, is that we don't know what tomorrow holds. But we better know Jesus. It seems like there's I don't know how to say this in a way that I don't say that, it, that, that it's necessarily here, but it can easily be me. It could easily be you. It could be any of us. So many times we get so caught up in wanting things to just go back to normal. And I feel it. I know what you're talking about. But yet, would it be better to go back to normal 
and you go back to the way we cared about the things of this world and the things of this life? Or would it be better that things stayed like they were and we kept trusting more and more in Jesus? You say, preacher, that's strange. And I don't want to think like that. And I don't want to be like that. But we could be like Paul and say, none of these things move me because Jesus is inside of me. Because the Spirit of the Lord is inside of me. Because I am filled with the presence and the power of the Holy Ghost. And it don't matter what comes or goes. No matter how much trouble, how much woe, how much nuttiness, how much craziness that comes along. I'm not going to be moved by it because I know I'm going to where Jesus has the place prepared for me. That's all I know. I'm not going to get stuck down here on this earth. And I'm not going to get fretting about what's going on in this old world. Because I'm looking for Jesus to come. That's what Paul is saying in essence. None of these things move me. If we're perplexed, if we're in despair, if we're in all of these things, and yet God has a way to get us out of it. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He strengthens us today too. His power is limitless. Christ's power to save. Christ's power to heal. Christ's power to move. It's limitless. None of these things should move us. Whatever we see, it is troubles, troublesome. It, it is perplexing. It, it, is, it is unimaginable sometimes, the things that we're seeing coming up on this world. But just know this. Christ is greater than all. He's greater than anything that's going on in this world. Any power that's moving across this earth, any power that's flexing its muscles or, or brandishing its weapons in front of us, there's nothing greater than the power of Jesus Christ and his blood. I would rather be like Paul than, than King Agrippa. If you go to the 26th chapter of Acts, you can read and find out about this. And, you know, he, Paul is able to present the gospel to King Agrippa. And he says, King Agrippa, I know you're familiar with this stuff. I'm just paraphrasing. He says, I know you know what's going on. I know you're familiar with the Jewish customs. I, I know you've heard about Jesus. I know you weren't, you know, you weren't under a rock somewhere when all this was going on. You know what I'm talking about. King Agrippa just says, almost you persuade me to be a Christian. Some commentaries say that he was saying that in jest. I don't know. I'm not sure that I believe that. I believe that Paul had a good enough argument that it struck King Agrippa. I believe it was something that caused him to think strongly about what Paul is saying. But he didn't want to leave his power and his story and his prestige to be like Paul who was bound with chains and was talking about Jesus and the freedom that he could have. It says it's not known that he's, it's known that he spent the last two years under house arrest waiting his audience with Nero. There's literature that says that close to the time that indicates that Paul was either tried and executed by the sword or he died during the persecution that came about after the great fire that Nero was reputed to have incited the blaze in 64 AD. Some people even have the tradition that Paul had escaped the persecution and went on to continue his preaching in Spain. Whatever his end, it is certain that Paul was a great influence on modern Christianity, both through his missionary work and his writing. And we'll close with this tonight. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 2. That you be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. We're here tonight, don't be shaken in mind. Don't be shaken in spirit. Don't let the things of this world trouble you. Because Jesus is greater than any of this. 
He's greater than any of this. One thing I'm certain of tonight, that there's no power, there's no demon, there's no forces out of hell, there's no forces in this world, there's no power anywhere that you could ever find in this universe that's greater than the power of Christ. There's no power. And we've got to come to the realization that everything that we see is a deception. It, it is an exploitation of power. It is a, is a fake. It is not the real. And we've got to stand in the power and the presence of the Spirit. We need the power of the Holy Ghost ministering unto us so that we can minister unto others.